it's interesting when you hear a talk from a, a teacher which has given you so much, and sometimes there's a certain note that rings out in it. Um, and hearing the word forgiveness, I don't know if people could hear that kind of resonate through all the the strings of people's hearts. But this concept of being able to forgive those we're coming to this gathering, having held something in our hearts against out in the world, in our lives. And also all those places of aversion and anger and frustration, the news cycle, and maybe also a past or a history that is uh, something that we feel a lot of aversion to right now as well, and maybe regret many things in. And can we come and take this opportunity to come together and offer forgiveness to the world for being what it is and to one another? And I think it's hard to, um, it's hard to forgive something when that's your only source of well-being. So when all we have is the world or the relationship or this history we chew on, then it's hard to forgive because we're still relying on that for our sense of well-being. But what's, I think, very significant is when you've come to the Dhamma and when you've begun to touch this teaching, there's a sense that you have something else now. There's a different melody, uh, there's a different refuge which you have. And no longer do you have to invest your heart completely in a world which is fragile and changeable and always on the brink of breaking. So I think most of us can remember our first time coming into contact with the Dhamma and that sense of recognition of profound and deep resonance when the Buddha inspires those he's teaching. They say it's wonderful, it's marvelous, it's as if what had been turned upside down has been turned upright. What had been has been covered has been uncovered as if a lamp had been lit in a dark place. And the sense of recognition, hearing uh, a note or a song which we have known deep down for maybe our whole lives or longed for. And um, Ajahn Jayasaro says that's what it was like to meet Longpur Cha. It was like meeting the first normal person he'd ever he'd ever met, normal in a whole different sense, as if every flower he'd seen before had been a fake flower, and suddenly he saw a real uh, wildflower for the first time. And so as we come into Dharmic community, as we come closer to that deeper note of truth, and this language is everywhere in, in the suttas. Uh, Longpur Pasno is referencing it last night where the Buddha says, um, speaks about dwelling in harmony and not just in harmony with one another, but in harmony with perhaps something much deeper with the Dhamma. And I remember asking a Catholic nun I knew what had kept her in robes after so many years. And she said, after a while, the voice of God became the most important thing to her. And we don't have quite that language, but we do have this language of alignment with the Dhamma, of harmony with the Dhamma. And the thing is, that's a different song than you'll hear in the world. The Buddha says that the noble ones perceive as suffering what the world perceives as happiness, and the world perceives as suffering what the noble ones perceive as happiness. And this subtle um, and changing this song, which maybe we've only begun to hear through the static of the world, it's such a precious thing. In uh, one sutta, the Buddha says that as a cow would, even while she grazed, never forget or neglect her calf. Even so, when a practitioner, though a practitioner goes about their duties, they never forget and give esteem to those who are practicing. 
So the sense of like, as we all go about our lives, as you do your duties to your job, to your family, not forgetting and holding in your heart like a mother would her child, like a cow would her calf, this precious thing you found, which is delicate and is embodied in this community. And the chance to come together every now and again and hear that note ring out in a new space. And our teachers are a bit like tuning forks. We, uh, we might not know how off tune we've become. And then, you know, Long Propasano or Ayananda Bodhi comes along and you uh, spill your coffee on the breakfast table in the morning. And Long Propasano calls you to mindfulness. So that happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> But just to really uh, value this chance to come together and reorient ourselves and hear loud and clear this precious note of the Dhamma and others who are resonating with that sympathetic resonance of the same note. And the idea that someday um, working towards a place protected where that note will have a chance to ring and grow uh, in volume and subtlety in the scope of samsara the chance to be a part of building a refuge like this like what what a gift and so just really rejoicing in that and in terms of seeing that deeper note to acknowledge one more which is the the female voices our sisters that have been largely absent for so long from it to see them coming and coming together and see that essential part of the song kind of rising in volume and harmony as well is such a gift. So just saying we are so grateful to see this gathering as, as always and see this kind of gathering song. And um, yeah, now we'll, we'll eat food together, I suppose. Um, but before that, we want to introduce the Friends of Clear Mountain board. Um, and that's uh, Steve Wilhelm, our vice president, uh, Kim Tool Esterberg, our Esterbrook, our president. I don't know where they are. You can come up. We'll have you speak. Oh, you're hiding. Good. No, you're not hiding. You're right there. Allison, our treasurer, and Dave, our secretary. And that they'll speak briefly about the um, vision of Clear Mountain as the monastics go take their food, and afterwards we'll give a blessing. <laughs> 